Hey everyone, this is Andrew from Gamba Red, and today we're going to talk about a challenging subject on red light therapy and heat, and when you're going to feel the heat, how to manage heat, and kind of what's the real kind of correlation to heat, wavelength, intensity, and all those important factors. Uh, you know, some of the background is that photobiomodulation was actually specifically def defined as being non-thermal. It's a non-thermal study of wavelengths of, of light. It could be any wavelength. It could be blue, it could be green, red, near-infrared, some, even some mid-infrared, as long as it's not heating, as long as it doesn't intentionally produce heat, as long as it doesn't raise the skin temperature and they monitor that. And, you know, this isn't something that I'm making up. You can find it in the, in the background section of any photobiomodulation study. They reiterate the definition of what their objective is. They're studying photobiomodulation, the non-thermal effects. And so this brings up a very important po point of like, how often should we be mixing heat and red light therapy? And again, you know, there's a lot of information being lost currently due to the marketing of, of red light therapy. So we typically say as a, as a generalization, that you know we're working with 600 nanometers to 900 nanometers near infrared so from red to near infrared in, in kind of a, a narrow window and we say that's the optical window that's the window that can penetrate through the skin and, and get some into your your cells and into your body into your muscle bone organs you know all these great things where you can get benefits deeper into the body and so they also say these are the non-thermal wavelengths, right? Um, so, so we kind of reiterate that, but I just keep on seeing a lot of overgeneralizations, uh, especially used in the marketing, and people are getting their information from companies selling, uh, you know, big heavy red light panels, when it seems like we're losing a lot of that common knowledge, we're losing a lot of the complexity, we're not appreciating the, the nuance of red light therapy and I just try to keep bringing that back and you know I, I write posts a lot about biphasic dose about you know how much is too much about um, the heat effects about you know uh, the dangers of it could you break down you know if you have too much heat in your eye could it break down your your lens and your cornea yes it can and so that's why you want to be mindful of managing the heat and when they discovered low-level laser therapy that's the thing. A lot of lasers are very high powered. You get a laser hit on your skin, you know, you could get a little bit of thermal damage, right? You get a laser hit in the eye, you could lose your sight, right? So this is important. And that's when they came out with lower level light and they started studying it on rats and then people, and they said the lower level light actually is stimulatory. It's, very, it's beneficial. And so we want to be, be mindful of that balance. And LEDs are a little bit different because they're more divergent, they're non-coherent, right? The, the waves aren't all stacked up, they're actually quasi-mono wavelength. And so that means you're actually getting a, a, a small distribution centered around your wavelength. So say you have a 660 nanometer wavelength, that's usually going to be your peak or your middle wavelength. But there's actually some wavelengths on either side, like plus or minus 15 or 20, depending on what you set your, your boundaries to be. So that's, you know, that's, these are all nuances that, you know, even me, I just say, oh, I use 660 nanometer, I use 850 nanometer, 630 in some of my lights. And I just say that's, that's the specification of the LED, but um, if you look into some of my details on my website, I kind of talk about how there is a distribution curve. So sometimes you want to be mindful of that. A laser is usually monochromatic, single wavelength and LEDs are quasi-monochromatic. So it's, again, all these subtle dis differences that nobody talks about. It's not very interesting. It, it might not even affect the, the benefits, um, but you know, there are important details because eventually if we get more nuanced and we get deeper into the science, these, are, these kind of details might become more relevant and we don't want to lose that. So anyway, um, the point of this is actually we're going to talk about heat and intensity and wavelengths. Um, so I've got my Gemba Red Oomph here. You know, it's a similar high-powered, similar to a lot of the high-powered lights you have on the market, but I just made a 
small little size for it because I like smaller sizes, they're easier to move around. But it's still similar to a lot of the lights you get on the market. Each of these LEDs is a 3 watt rated LED. So we know, you know, the, the ratings of an LED you don't want to exceed because you'll just burn out the LED. I've done it before. You, you drive too much current through an LED that's not rated for it, you kill the LED, it's done. You gotta get a new one. So you don't want that. You don't want to overcurrent it. And typically we run it under the rated uh, uh, current, right? So under the rated wattage. So current times voltage gets you your wattage. So you run it under under rating. That's good. It keeps the LEDs a little bit cooler, makes them live a little longer, keeps the whole device from, from heating up so you can manage the heat a little better. Sometimes you have to have a fan you know, to keep it cool, sometimes you don't, depending on how much how much power the, the entire device is making and how you manage it with heat sinks and fans. Um, so these are three watt bulbs. These are tip right, these are the typical bulbs. We're gonna we run them a little bit under rating, so maybe we're probably only running them at two watts, you know, maybe. Um, so let's say we're running them at two watts, uh, all these bulbs, and then we get a power measurement, right? We can use a solar power meter, a cheap, cheap one, and this is where we get really inflated irradiance numbers. And this is going to be my difficulty when I talk to people about intensity and heat, and I can tell some someone a number like, hey, I think based on my research, you can look up, I have a blog currently on this with some really good references. I say at about 30 milliwatts per centimeter squared, you'll start to feel some heat. You'll feel that warmth. And it's a nice, it's a very nice kind of warmth. You like, you know, as long as you're, it's kind of a steady state warmth, you're not, your tissues aren't heating up, you're not feeling like the sting of like radiant heat like you feel from the sun or from a fire. Um, you know, that's a nice, that's a nice, you get a little bit of warmth. And that's the kind of instant gratification that a lot of people get from all these high-powered lights that are coming out of the market, they're saying, oh, they're 2x the, the, the leading brand, you know, two or three times the power, they're using 5-watt bulbs, they're using all these, these fancy things, and then cu customers get them and they say, wow, I feel the warmth, you know, it has to be doing something, I feel all this, this heat, radiant, you know, you're feeling radiant heat, like, you're not feeling any of the warmth from the device, usually you're a few inches away, you're feeling radiant heat from the device. And that, you know, that leads into, like, even more myths because you know they advertise okay you're at six inches away and they'll advertise 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared at six inches and we know that's not true anymore if you read some of my blog posts or if you ask me for references I can tell you if someone's saying that they're at 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared uh, they're probably closer to 40s like you know 40 plus or minus 5 um, if they're especially if they're basing the data off of a solar power meter so that's my difficulty so if i say oh you're going to feel warm at about 30 and people look at me they're like well no i'm getting 100 i'm getting you know i'm getting all these all these milliwatts from from my from my name brand light uh, you know andrew what are you talking about only 30 starts to warm up but I, I only feel the heat at 100 and so we can't even we can't even talk i can't even talk scientifically you know with real measurements because none of the measurements are out there we're not taking measurements the same way that the scientists are taking measurements in the clinical studies in in the research they're using higher higher quality laser measurement systems uh, radio spectrometers again i have a, a blog post all about this and and the proper techniques and how to avoid pitfalls with measurements so so that's the difficulty. So I'm going to talk now about some of the heat effects, and and this keeps kind of all these all these you know marketing terms and all these these inaccurate readings. They all lend itself to to all these um, uh, mis misunderstandings. And then because so many people are new, they're coming in new to this market. This market's been around for a few years of of doing these high high powered panels. This is like the truth right you you come in new you're fresh and you're you found found some great research on the benefits you found some influencer who's who's talking about all these benefits and now now you know all this stuff is locked in it's been around for for years and now it seems like it's the truth so it's really disappointing and i'm trying to work against the tide against the current to to re-educate people and understand the nuance and appreciate the nuance um the other thing 
like I said, you start feeling all this warmth from a panel, and then there's another myth that 850 nanometers, the invisible near-infrared bulbs uh, that we use are very common. 850 nanometers, it's a near-infrared that has slightly more of a warming effect, so a lot of people say, oh, that's the warming, right? That's the warmth that you feel. That 850 is more warming, 660 is, is less warming, it's more for surface, 850 you get a little bit more water absorption. And while that's true, it's only marginal. Again, I have a blog post where you zoom in, you can zoom in on the graph of water absorption. 850 is just like a smidge higher than uh, 660 on the graph. It, it's really irrelevant when it's, it zips up so high when you get into 900s and thousands of nanometers, um, you know, into after a thousand. That's where the heating really takes over. But like I said in the beginning, from 600 to 900, you're pretty safely in the non-thermal region. And so why are you feeling heat if, if, you know, like I said, 850 is kind of irrelevant, it's mostly intensity driven. So like I said, at about 30, you might start feeling some warmth that feels great. Um, and again, once you start creeping up into 50, 80, 100 in real milliwatt, you know, real units, milliwatts per centimeter squared on a, on a properly calibrated uh, laser device, that's where you start to feel the heat. That's where you have to start managing the heat. And once you understand all these nuances, that's, that's what you need to manage. It's the intensity. So within that range, 600 to 900, you need to understand the intensity and how that's affecting your heat effects. It's not about wavelength. And I've linked to a couple posts that are interesting on my Facebook group, on my Facebook page for Gember Red LLC, where you can take lasers, right? You can take lasers of any color, red, blue, green. They use lasers. It's really fascinating. And they use a laser. And you can burn holes through stuff. You can burn holes. You can pop balloons. Um, I even saw a guy using a high-powered flashlight, just a white, white flashlight. And he used a magnifying glass, and he burned some stuff. So these are, you can be heating with any wavelength with high enough intensity. Like I said, when they first started with low level laser therapy, they, they were turning it down so you don't feel that heat, you don't burn your skin. Uh, that's the whole point. Um, so, so that's the important part. So if I turn this on, my nice Gimba Red Oomph, high power, three watt bulbs, and I turn it to me, and I'm you know, maybe a foot away, I can pretty immediately feel, you know, without the device even warming up much, you can pretty immediately feel some warmth. It's a cold winter day, right? I'm in the basement. It's cold, so I can feel that warmth. It's warming up my face a little bit. That's pretty nice. That's pretty good. Maybe at this distance, I'm around 20 milliwatts per centimeter squared. That's probably where I'd like to be, right, for just a general low-dose kind of kind of thing and these are these are real intensity numbers like I said if if I hold this up to my where my face is right now right and then I can hold it up maybe I'll do a max hold so you can see yeah so we can see you know I'm feeling I don't know if you can see All right according to this it's about 38 because I was about a foot away, right? And so that's, that, you know, it doesn't make sense, because if I'm still a foot away and I'm not measuring anything, but uh, now I'll do it here. So the max hold says it's 14 milliwatts, and then I have to do some math. So 14 milliwatts, let's see if we can just to that. So let's say we're at 14 milliwatts and I have to do a quick conversion. Well, it's closer to 15, but so it's 15. So let's do 15 times point, oh, divided by 0.636 times 0.8 is actually 18. So, I, you know, it's only about 9, so let's say it's 19, we'll round up. So, right, e even according to this, this is, this is about 19, this was reading 
height, what, 38? So it's about double, right? It's about double. So that's why when I try to explain to people, you'll feel some warmth, uh, especially around 30, but like even here, it was only at 20 because I'm in a cold room and I can feel that warmth. So it's, we're, we're, we're not even talking the same units. We're not talking the same language. Um, the other thing I see now, uh, a lot of panels have the two modes, right? You can control red and the near infrared separately. There's two switches. I only do I only do one switch because I think there's no need for multiple switches. It only adds more comp complications. It adds more decisions for the consumer. You know, of like, oh, which one should I do? Should I do both? And um, people would ask me questions. I'll just say, just do both, right? Um, so a lot of people say, oh, if I turn off the near infrared, there's less heat. It's got to be coming from the near infrared, right? And again, that's partially true. Near infrared is, is a slight uptick in the water absorption. It's got some more, a little bit more heat effect to it. But what you're doing when you turn off the near infrared, you cut the intensity in half. You turn off half of your bulbs, right? Turn off half your bulbs, and you have half the intensity. You have half the, you know, half the heat, right? And so that's the heat effect. You know, it's intensity driven, especially if you're in the, the, the right range, the non-thermal range. It's intensity driven. You've turned off half your lights, you get half the intensity, and there you go. And I think some of that confusion is that companies aren't saying, they only say, you know, with all the lights on. They advertise, say, 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared at six inches, but they don't tell you if you only use one mode, you get half you get half of that, right? If you're only using one one set of switches, then you only get half the intensity. And I, I think maybe to me that's obvious, and maybe to a lot of people it's obvious, but to some people, like, you need to, like, know that. And, and if companies aren't advertising, you, you can only assume you're still getting the full force when you're not, right? So it's, it's pretty crazy. So... So... I did my whole rant about heat and wavelength and intensity and, and some of the misconceptions and why you see the, the misconceptions with red and near infrared and, and intensity and all these misconceptions. And when you feel heat, it's mostly intensity driven and uh, uh, it's not necessarily, if you've got only 850 nanometer bulbs, it doesn't make sense. That's not the heat component. The heat component is mostly driven by intensity. If you have high enough intensity red, like I said, lasers or whatever, you're going to feel heat. You can burn the skin. You can burn your eyes, right? This is this is common knowledge. It's fact. I'm not telling you anything special. You can, like I said, you can Google it. There's all these safety factors about, you know, laser, especially red lasers and high concentration lasers. So what we're going to do, we're going to get into the experiment of how we, we can manage heat in different devices, and especially talking about how we can use pulsing, how we can use scanning, how we can use, uh, uh, you know, different, you know, modulating the intensity to bring it down. These, these are the real thermal management techniques, right? And uh, all of this is lost, all this, this interesting nuance is lost just because we're just working with high powered kind of, kind of panels, right? And that's, that's all a lot of people know. So I've got this light. This is a little little light I, I built. Um, it's 660 nanometers. It's got a nice aluminum sturdy case. And I don't know if you can see, there's actually three bulbs. There's three bulbs in here. And each of these bulbs is driven at the same power. They're three watt bulbs. So I've got three three watt bulbs clustered together in the same kind of emitter hole that you see here, right? So a single, so we've got a single emitter, but we've got three bulbs, the same rating as these, and we're driving them at almost full power, about, um, I'd say about two watts each. So this is a six watt LED emitter, 660 nanometer, six watts. So this is only two watts, right? Because we only run it at, at about two watts. This is six. So it's three times the power coming out such a small hole. That's where you get the milliwatts per centimeter squared. The centimeter squared, that's the area. And we've got three high-powered bulbs being emitted. So that's going to be 
a lot more intensity than your average, you know, even a three or five watt bulb, this, this can beat it easily, right? Um, so now we can really understand the thermal effects from a 660 nanometer uh, little, little bulb. So what we're going to do is turn it on. And we can see it's got a nice, it's got spot optics, right? It's got a narrow beam, really focused. I don't know if you can see. It's really focused. So, you know, I can hold it on my skin. And I'm not feeling any heat from the electronics, right? The electronics, there's kind of a friction when, whenever there's electricity th flowing, there's a friction. And friction creates heat. And especially when you're running electricity over... LEDs, when you're running them over resistors or different components, that creates more heat. That creates that kind of friction-like effect. And so I don't feel that because we've got a nice thick um, metal case here. So that's absorbing all the heat. The LEDs are mounted with some thermal paste, you know, right on onto the, this. So I don't feel the heat from that. But what I do feel is that if I'm pressing into the skin, you can almost see how I'm pressing into my skin, but my entire, the entire area of my arm that I press it into is glowing red because it's, the light is scattering through my skin and some of that scattering and coming back out, you know, traveling through my skin and coming back out. It's like a crazy kind of phenomenon. That light isn't just going straight into your skin, right? It's not going straight in. It's bouncing around. It's bouncing off collagen. It's bouncing off all your cells and stuff. And now I'm feeling a lot of heat. I'm feeling radiant heat like a burning kind of sensation because like I said that heat has been building while I've been talking and now now it's starting to sing so I'm gonna I'm gonna take it off because I don't want I don't want to create a burn I don't want to create you know some people even say if that they have very sensitive skin I've heard people post on forums if they're just using something like this they use it for too long too close you can get kind of a redness you can get kind of a thermal effect and that I don't think that's good because it'll really sensitize your skin the next time you use it your skin might be too sensitive and it'll you'll keep bringing back that redness so if you get redness if you burn oh man I did it too long uh, if you burn part of your skin you actually need to lay off you know red light therapy probably for a while weeks or months to let that really settle down otherwise you just bring in back you, you've sensitized you've sensitized that area of the skin so you really don't want that. So I heated up this part. It's still very warm, right? I brought a lot of blood flow. I brought some inflammation now. It's a nice hot spot. Um, so that's not cool. So how do we, like if I want to use this as a high powered light, could be a couple hundred milliwatts per centimeter squared. Again, this is real, real power that I'm talking about now. Whereas I just did a, a video where you know all these companies are claiming that this is doing 200 milliwatts per centimeter squared at the surface and I showed how that's wrong and it's maybe only 50 55 at the most at the surface you know at each bulb you can measure so they're advertising 200 but it's actually only 50 50 is a very reasonable dose if you do it right that's great but you know people get in their minds oh you're getting 200 and it feels fine but you don't understand. If you're getting a couple hundred, 200, 300, like, like I estimate from this, I can't even measure it because it's too high. Couple hundred, 100, 200, 300, that's heating, right? That's, that's the heat. Um, so like I said, it's so hard for me to, to try to explain this and talk about these, these terms when you, when, you, when you really get into it. And like I said, you really have to feel it. You have to feel it to believe it, that this is 660 nanometer red, it's really hot due to the high intensity. My body just can't thermoregulate fast enough, so I built up a lot of heat on my skin. It's pretty red now. So you've built up all this heat, and uh, I see three discrete spots, one for each of the bulbs, and that's built up quite a lot of heat. So my body couldn't manage all that heat, and it started to break down, so it's not good. So how do we manage heat, right? So let's say, you know, you have a high-powered laser or a high-powered 
uh, device. I like using LEDs because they're a lot safer. Even if I fool around and burn myself, right, it's a lot less dangerous than a, a laser. So I like, I, I always work with LEDs. So I made this high powered LED. And so say, say I want to use it appropriately, then I'll do it. I know, you know, after 30 seconds, my skin starts to heat up. So I'm going to do it only 15 seconds per spot. And that's probably plenty, right? Like I said, if you're if you're working at 200 or 300 milliwatts per centimeter squared, you can get a good dose in 10 seconds, 30 seconds. So let's let's keep it at 10 seconds, and then I'm going to move, right? And then yeah, I'll never build up too much heat. I'm getting a good dose at each spot, and this is how a lot of laser studies are done. They do discrete spots around the target area if they're targeting like a muscle group or, or targeting a, a you know brain areas. So you just keep kind of moving it. You do your, your little doses at each spot and never let it heat up. Don't keep it on for minutes at a time and then, then you, you end up with problems. Or like a lot of lasers, they do a scanning technique. You can go back and forth over that area. I think it's harder to kind of track the dosage that way. Uh, but it's not, you know, obviously you're never holding it still. So your, your body always has time to thermoregulate as I go back and forth you're, you're warming and cooling and you've got plenty of time just to just to do this and so maybe you know and obviously you can calculate maybe some sort of average intensity average dosage that that you're doing as, as long as you kind of know your parameters um, so that's fine so you do the, do a scanning technique you can do discrete spots okay so I just changed the battery on my camera so I'll have more life so we just went over scanning, we went over discrete spots that you only hold for a few seconds. Again, if you only hold for 10 seconds, 300 milliwatts per centimeter squared, that's, that's a decent dose per spot. The joules add up, especially because I'm not even using a laser, I'm using a much bigger spot size LED. You know, a laser is a very small spot size, usually less, you know, it's like point. 0.2 centimeters like is the diameter it's like usually very small um, so this is a much bigger area so you get the jewels add up and and you can get discrete spots but let's say we've got some fancy controllers on here and we want to do some other things so the other way the other way you can control the intensity is you simply dial down the power so I've got this little trim pot on here it's gonna add resistance which will reduce the power output you know power to the LEDs and reduces the brightness right reduces the intensity so I'm gonna twist this oh so I can turn it off with it but you can see I can dim it I can make it bigger smaller right I can make it bright dim right so maybe I just want to reduce the intensity down to something a little bit lower and safer that way you know it's mistake proof you can I can hold it on my skin I can hold it wherever and I can do it for a very long period of time without ever risking any thermal damage uh, and and you know a lot of times the studies show you want at least 10 minutes or maybe you need a couple minutes just to get that beneficial effect so some studies are actually telling me you need time is an important factor not just intensity you can't just give yourself some high intensity and for a couple of seconds that's not always equivalent to a low intensity you do for minutes or or tens of minutes you know that's very different you can't just trust that a dose is a dose that a joule is a joule how is that joule delivered you know is it being pressed into the skin are you letting a lot of it reflect off your skin by being off off the light are you doing a long period of time, low period of time? You know, so a joule's not always a joule. You have to be mindful of all these parameters and the nuance. So we can reduce it down. And, you know, that's what I do with most of my Gemba Red lights. My most popular lights are much lower intensity. You can use them for, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. There's, you're never going to overload your, your cells. You're never going to overheat. The panel does warm up, but, like, you know, the radiant heat, like I showed, is never going to be that hot right so it's this really nice low level it's mistake proof and if you own your own device and you can use it every day for months at a time um you know that's very different than you know a study that they have to deliver a high dose and get a high, you know get a response within you know maybe a couple treatments or a couple weeks 
that's all they have to work with the patient. So you come in, give them a high dose, and hopefully that creates a response. If you own your own device, it just makes sense to, to spread it out longer, to go with lower doses. Um, you know, there should be a difference between kind of a therapeutic dose that's used, you know, in studies or used by doctors versus, you know, kind of a general wellness, kind of a maintenance dose, kind of like, you know, you're not going to you're not going to do therapeutic doses of vitamin C every day. Uh, you know, that doesn't always make sense. You, you're going to go, you know, maybe every day you do a normal amount. And then if you have a cold, you do a high dose vitamin C or something like, you know, if you believe, if you're into that, um, that's the same thing. If you're doing a daily red light therapy, you can be a little bit lower. Maybe if you're trying to target something specific, that's when you might want to target that area and give it a little bit more, right? That's, that's kind of how we need to start thinking about these things. So, so we can pr reduce it down, but we don't want to reduce it down. We want our intensity, right? We paid a lot of money for a high, high power device, you know, but we want all that intensity because you can see as I bring back the intensity, maybe how it penetrates through my knuckle will show you some, show you how that intensity is really important. I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but you can start to see more of that glow, more of that penetration of the red light through my skin. And again, this is another kind of factoid where it's a lot of mis misinformation that they say, oh, near infrared is more penetrating. I, th I think red is, is perfectly fine with the penetration as long as you, especially if you're doing the, the you're pressing it into the skin, right? You're, do you're dosing it right. So you can kind of see that through through my knuckle, at, you know, when we put it at the high intensity. So what we can do, because I still don't want to burn myself, we're going to switch it over to pulsing, right? So pulsing is a great way to manage that thermal buildup. Like I said, instead of scanning, we can just pulse it. So I can, you know, again, I can just kind of hold it in one spot. And the pulsing, every time, you know, it goes off, that gives my cells and my body some time to cool off. That's the main reason for, for using a pulsing device, right? Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that say, oh, if you just switch over to pulsing mode, you get a new set of benefits. You get 10 hertz as an alpha brain wave, um, you know, 40 hertz as gamma. There's Neuger frequencies. There's Schumann frequencies. It's about 8, eight hertz. So there's all these different frequencies. But the main reason, if you read the pulsing studies, they're using it as a thermal management technique, right? That's the ultimate reason. And the problem with a lot of the studies and the way we think about red light therapy, when they do a pulsing study, they're going to they're going to compare the max intensity, so they're going to say, you know, let's say we've got 300 milliwatts per centimeter squared, uh, just to keep the numbers around. So we've got 300 and I'm pulsing it at a 50% duty cycle, so the average intensity is actually 150. Right? It's half of it because it's off off half of the time on half the time. So your average intensity is 150. That's how you calculate your new dose when you're pulsing. That's standard. You know, again, um, this is this is pretty straightforward um, stuff. Now, what they do when they compare pulsing versus continuous is actually they're not comparing to 300 milliwatts continuous. Right? They're not. They're actually comparing it to half the power. So we, they dial it down to to much lower. They dial it down to actually only 150. So now you're comparing 150 continuous to 300 pulsed. And that's because they believe they want to match the same dosage. They want to match, match the same average intensity. And so that's what they're doing. But you can already see that the pulsing seems to get much more energy saturation through my scales and through my skin that pulse so so that's how they use it and all the studies i read they're you know they're comparing 300 peak intensity pulsed versus uh you know half that much in continuous wave so that's the big difference that's the special part of pulsing you it enables you to increase your power output it enables you to do higher intensity that's the key you, you know without the thermal damage and so that's the big thing I think we're kind of missing because there's some panels out there, there's some products they say, oh, you buy our thing and it's got some pulsing. So, oh, if you just flip over to pulsing, it's got a new set of, of benefits. It's got these special, special benefits that, you know, look at all these pulsing studies, they cherry pick the data, you know, just like everyone else. 
and they say there's a new set. Of, it's, that's not true because these panels, they're not increasing the intensity to offset the duty cycle. So we don't actually don't know, you know, how, how impactful pulsing is. Maybe, like I said, if you got a 10 hertz pulse and you want to entrain your brain waves, then you do, you do something like this. Maybe the 10 hertz is also helping your brain waves while also giving you the PBM. I'm into that. I like that. Um, but again, that's, you know, it's not fully fleshed out right now. We don't, we don't know the full details of pulsing. And there's not a ton of studies about pulsing people's brains, but it looks very, very promising that you can entrain the brain and maybe create a new type of, of benefit for the brain. So anyway, so that's, that's the kind of lowdown. So we can use different techniques to manage heat. Heat is not, right? So it's not just wavelength dependent. As long as you're in the right non-thermal range, 600 to 900, that's pretty much the safe range to say, okay, we're non-thermal pretty much for sure. It's intensity driven always. I can burn myself with high enough intensity. It's mostly gone away. It's been about 30 minutes since I started, but so most of that thermal damage, that redness went away already. So I'm, I'm okay. But it's, you can, you can burn yourself with red. You can burn yourself with near infrared. Doesn't matter. You know, it's intensity driven. It's not so much the wavelength. And I think there's a lot of misunderstandings. Again, like I said, just the way things are being marketed, things are being oversimplified. Um, you know, certain people act like they're experts and they're really just kind of regurgitating a couple things that they know, or maybe they're just saying what happened to work for them. And, and, you know, you have to understand the really nuanced, the context, all the details to say one thing applies to another. So, so hopefully this helps really understand, dig in, clarify a lot of the, the, the misconceptions around heating, around wavelengths, around intensity. Um, you know, hopefully these, uh, Hopefully these videos are beneficial and, um, you know, they're not too long. I kind of, I'm starting to rant more in these videos to rant about the stuff that I know that's all cooped up in my head and maybe hopefully you've made it to the end and, and you've learned something. Um, so if you have other questions or, or you, you want to see other kind of experiments, just let me know and we'll try to put, put more information together. Thank you.